With AMD and Nvidia gearing up for their next generation GPU launches, it's well, the perfect time to revisit our testing data. We've been hard at work retesting a mountain of graphics cards, over 60 to be in fact, to ensure everything is up to date and ready for the comparisons coming your way towards the end of the month. Why retest all these GPUs though? And what does the current landscape look like on the latest drivers? Well, that's what we're gonna be talking about today because we've got some fresh benchmark results to share with you. But before we get into that, here's a quick word from this video sponsor. All right, stay calm. You've got one job. Do not let this thing overheat. It's running hot. How do I don't know if it's safe? Get the Wireview Pro. The Wireview Pro safeguards your graphics card with real-time power and temperature monitoring, acoustic alarms for custom thresholds, and sensor pin detection to ensure proper 12VH PWR connection. External sensors can monitor additional components like memory or voltage regulators, while an OLED display provides instant insights, meaning that this is the last time you'll blow a 12VH PWR connector, soldier. To keep your system protected, click the link in the description below. Now, being a reviewer and doing mass amounts of benchmarking definitely takes its toll. While some may think it involves sitting there, pressing a button and off you go, there's actually a lot more to it. Some games and applications are well, pretty automated, like 3D Mark, while others involve doing the same run in-game over and over and over again. When you think about our game features that we do and we test, for example, 30 graphics cards at three resolutions at four quality settings, and then with and without ray tracing, and then with and without upscaling, that can sometimes involve over 500 data points. And at a conservative, let's say, three minutes per run without retests, that's sometimes in excess of multiple days of solid testing with no breaks, no sleep. So we've kind of started early because old data doesn't serve well for anyone. There's also the element of time taken to actually analyze the data and then if needed, do retests. So I guess what I'm trying to say is there's a lot involved and that's taken into account that everything goes well, swimmingly, which rarely, rarely it does. For instance, with this round of testing, we had issues with two Intel cards that just simply refused to boot all the time that we had the PCIe gen setting in the BIOS set to auto. And instead we had to manually set it, but it took us time to figure these little nuanced problems out. We also have other things to consider when retesting this many cards, especially in the kind of interest of fairness. Drivers change, games get updated, and then even on top of that, games become, well, unpopular. So why show you data from titles that no one plays? It all becomes a bit futile. And well, this brings us to the big point, updates, and more importantly, drivers. These can sometimes make a huge difference, especially when we look at what Intel have been able to do in the past by unlocking huge amounts of performance simply by fine tuning their drivers. Sure, that is, I guess, more of a testament to how poor the drivers were in the first place, but it still gives you an idea as to what's at least possible. Now, driver updates are crucial. They can significantly impact performance and ensuring that each card is performing as expected is vital. Outdated data just doesn't cut it when we're trying to give you the most accurate comparisons possible, especially when comparing to new yet to be released products like the Nvidia 50 series and the uh, AMD 9000 series that, well, even AMD don't wanna talk about. Now to ensure we're comparing apples to apples, we've returned to the lab with GPUs from AMD, Nvidia, and Intel to rerun tests using 3D Mark Times by Extreme and Port Royal. These synthetic benchmarks give us a consistent baseline for performance across the board and allow us to identify any outliers. This is especially crucial since some of the older cards that we've tested haven't been used in, well, quite some time and thermal paste can dry up over extended periods. So this allowed us to ensure they were all running optimally. So I guess one of the big questions comes down to why 3D Mark Times by Extreme and Port Royal? While most of our tests focus on real world gaming performance, synthetics still have an important place, especially as some GPUs, at least in their naming structure, can be convoluted as you go up in generation and naming convention. So what did we actually find? Well, here's a quick snapshot of how things stand with the latest drivers. And I guess this allows you to see exactly how your card should be performing with the hardware that we used. 
For our testing, we used our GPU test bench with an AMD Ryzen 7 9800X3D processor and 32 gig of Corsair Vengeance RGB 6000 MHz CL30 memory, all on a Gigabyte B650E Aorus Master motherboard. All testing was done on the latest version of Windows with the latest updates, and we used the latest drivers available from their respective vendors. In 3D Mark Times by Extreme, we found that to no surprise, the RTX 4090 was ahead of everything else by a pretty significant margin. The next best performing card, the RX 7900 XTX, only managed to reach 77% of the performance of the 4090 in the graphics score, with the regular score having a great deal less separation, with the 7900 XTX then falling 16% behind the RTX 4090. The 4080 and 4080 Super both came in a little lower than the XTX, with the Super only sitting with 2% less performance, whilst the non-Super sits 6% below in terms of the overall score. The graphics scores saw very similar results around here, with the Super sitting 3% behind and the non-Super sitting 8% behind the 7900 XTX from AMD. Then below the 4080s is the 7900 XT, so no surprise with the 4070 Ti Super sitting a little further behind that. Just short of the 4070 Ti Super, however, is the RTX 3090 Ti, a card that sells for far more money, with the 4070 Ti Super sitting 2% ahead with its overall score and nearly 3% ahead with its graphics score. Moving down further, we see the 6950 XT actually outperforming the 7900 GRE. Not by much, it must be said, but it's still interesting to see though, as it's only to the tune of around 2% in the overall score and a slightly larger 3% in the graphics score. Moving down further still, we see the 4070 Super comfortably sat between the 3080 Ti and the 3080, with the 6900 XT falling just behind. Interestingly, the 7800 XT is behind even the 6900 XT, with just under a single percent between them in the score and just over a single percent in the graphics score. Even though this isn't a big jump in performance and is realistically going to translate to being frankly impossible to notice in real-world scenarios, it does shed a decent light on the older series here, as this isn't the first time we've seen the last generation keeping up so well. Moving down the chart some more to find our first 20 series card, the 2080 Ti, we find it a little bit behind the 6800 and barely ahead of the RTX 3070, which falls behind by 2% in the score. Interestingly, this is also the point in which we see the graphics score start to fall below the regular score, and from here we can only expect this gap to widen. Also worth noting around this point is that we start to see the first glimpse of Intel with the ARC A770 making an appearance just below the RTX 3070, and it doesn't fare too poorly either with only a 3% lower score. Further down the chart still, we find the 2080 and the 2080 Super both being outperformed by the RX 7600 XT, which is one of AMD's lowest tier cards from the current generation. With a 2% higher score and just under a 3% higher graphics score, this is a pretty good testament to how far GPUs have come. The lowest tier is now on par with the higher tier from only two generations ago. Heading down a little more, we can find the 4060 not performing particularly amazing, with the RX 6700 just ahead of it with 2% higher performance in both the overall score and the graphics score as well. Just down from the 4060, we can see our first look at some 10 series cards, with a top-end GTX 1080 Ti coming in with a score of 5006 and a graphics score of 4742, which is surprisingly ahead of the RTX 2070, which falls 4% behind. As we move down the chart once again, we can see some of the 16 series starting to appear, with the 1660 Ti managing a score of 3,255 and a graphics score of 2,966, which finds itself 3% ahead when compared to the RTX 3050, which for what is meant to be a higher tier card is pretty underwhelming, but as an entry level way of adding ray tracing, we just have to see how it fares in Port Royal. As we look at the bottom of the chart, we start to see the cards that really just can't keep up anymore, but a lot of these cards will still be able to gain more than well enough at lower settings or lower resolutions, as Time Spy Extreme is more aimed at 4K gaming anyway, but has become a great tool to show relative performance between cards. And that shows when we get to the very bottom of the chart where the GTX 1050 sits, which is the only card that wasn't actually capable of scoring over a thousand points, and with a score of 309 and a graphic score of 265, well, this is easily the worst card here. Obviously, as we move over to Port Royal, which focuses on ray tracing performance, you'd expect the list of cards to get significantly smaller, as we'd admit the GTX cards, so 10 and 16 series, as that's the technology they lack. But that's not strictly true, as while they don't have dedicated hardware for ray tracing, they are still capable of running Port Royal through use of software-based ray tracing instead of utilizing hardware acceleration. It is less efficient and yields lower performance, but we thought we'd run it on those cards anyway. 
It's here as expected that Nvidia maintains a clear lead thanks to their dedicated RT cores. AMD has made strides with their RDNA 3 architecture, but ray tracing still seems to be Nvidia's game. As we look at the chart, we find to no surprise the RTX 4090 sitting out in front of all the other cards by quite some margin, with 39% more performance than the next highest card in the list, the 4080 Super. The 4080 and 4080 Super both outperform the top-end AMD card, the 7900 XTX, by 10% and 16% respectively, proving that Nvidia does still hold the crown when it comes to ray tracing. Down a little from here, we can see the 3090 Ti sitting only one position above the 4070 Ti, which is a much cheaper card, with the 4070 Ti only sitting 5% behind in performance. Down from here, we can see the RTX 3090 sitting just below the 7900 XT with less than 1% less performance, which is what I deem as identical. So if you're after one of these cards and the price is right, then well, go for whichever is cheaper. If we look a little further down the chart, we can see the 7900 GRE behind the 3080 12 gig and just ahead of the 10 gig model. But with only 0.2% more performance than the 10 gig and 6% less than the 12 gig, it's easy to see where the performance actually stacks up. But with this being a 16 gig card, there are still some benefits here, especially if you manage to find it for a competitive price. As we move further down, we start to see AMD's 6000 series cards appear with the 6950 XT being the first to show its face, just below the 3080 10 gig and the 6900 XT, but falling below the RTX 4070 and RX 7800 XT. Then moving further down still, we see the 2080 Ti barely ahead of the RX 7700 XT and just behind the RTX 3070 Ti, with both being less than a percent difference. At this point in the chart is when we start to see the first generation of ray tracing cards from Nvidia, and we really do see just how far they've come. With the current top flagship, the 4090 actually managing to outperform the first generation RTX flagship by 181%, which in all honesty is a pretty huge jump in just a few years. Moving down even more, we can see that sitting 9% behind the RTX 4060 Ti is the first Intel card that we've seen so far, the ARC A770. Now what's impressive about the A770 sitting here is how many RTX cards it manages to perform better than. For example, sitting just behind it is the RTX 3060 Ti, a card that you would expect to perform better at ray tracing given its RTX naming. But if you were looking for this level of performance, then maybe an A770 could be the way to go if you can find one cheaper than a used 3060 Ti. Skipping down a bit to the RTX 4060, we see it underperforming a bit given what you would hope, with so many other options performing higher up in this chart. So if you're all about ray tracing, then you can probably quite easily get your ray tracing fix elsewhere for a lower price, as even the ARC A750 manages an 11% higher score here. Beyond this, there isn't really too much else to say until we reach the RTX 3050, which quite frankly isn't faring too well. It performs decent enough that with a bit of upscaling you could get playable frame rates with ray tracing at 1080p, but at that resolution, upscaling starts to become a bit unsightly, and you'll be better off ditching the ray tracing in favour of either pure rasterization at 1080p or some upscaling at 1440, if you don't mind frame rates closer to 60fps. Just down from the 3050 is where we start getting into software ray tracing where the cards aren't geared hardware-wise for running ray tracing natively, and are instead relying on software to do it for them. This is obviously a much less elegant solution, hence all these results fall into the bottom of the chart, but we do see some interesting patterns here. The top end of the software ray tracing cards is all dominated by the higher end NVIDIA 10 series GPUs, with the top performer, the 1080 Ti, only falling 43% below the RTX 3050. And whilst this does sound like a lot, it's worth remembering that this isn't even running ray tracing properly, and instead is relying on much worse techniques to pull it off. Down from here are two Intel cards, the A380 and the A310, both of which do actually contain RT acceleration cores. So even though they are running ray tracing natively, you won't want to be using it on these cards anyway due to their performance. The GTX 1660s all come next in line with the 1660 Ti falling the furthest behind, but again, as this is software ray tracing, the results here aren't the best, so inconsistencies like this will be pretty common overall. Further down, we see the rest of the 10 series and 16 series cards all mixed up with the RX 6500 XT sitting in here just for good measure. And at the very bottom of the chart, we see the RX 6400 performing the worst of all the cards we tested with a score of only 271 points. Now, if we're being realistic though, this software ray tracing section of the chart is well, actually pretty volatile and could see some significant changes if we ran some retests. So consider everything below the RTX 3050 a fail, as no one will actually be running ray tracing on these cards anyway, and games likely wouldn't let you enable it or would at least throw up some issues. 
So what's the takeaway here? Well, the GPU market is as competitive as ever. And with new launches from AMD and Nvidia just around the corner, these standings will of course shift. With a big focus on AI and upscaling technology, with the tests that we ran here today, it shows well, the raw performance of what a GPU can do without DLSS, FSR, or ZSS. And to a lot of consumers, that's still the most important thing. That's also why retesting is so important. It ensures that we're ready to give you the most accurate and up-to-date comparisons when those new cards drop, which, as mentioned, is right around the corner. Of course, synthetic benchmarks are just one piece of the puzzle. Once the new GPUs are out, we'll be diving into real-world gaming performance, power efficiency, and thermals to give you a complete picture. And as we are retesting all of the GPUs shown here today, we will be doing a lot of updated head-to-head -head content in the next couple of weeks in the build-up to that release date. So make sure you're subscribed for that. There we have it. A lot of testing, a lot of data, and a lot of excitement for what's coming next. Now, if you enjoyed this video, a like and a sub to the channel would be amazing. And if you love what we do and appreciate the huge amounts of hard work that goes into these videos, then you can help support everything that we do over on Patreon. You'll get access to exclusive behind the scenes content, bi-weekly game nights, access to a lot, a lot more testing data, and much, much more. The link is as always down below. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you in the next one. See you later, guys. Bye-bye.